So my talk is going to resonate very much with the two previous ones, and I'm going to try to explain what I mean by radical complexity. It's going to be a short review from a, again the next physicist, uh, and, and how this idea of complexity allows to shed light, I think, on, on uh, uncertainty. So, you know, you've heard about the proverbial butterfly effect, so I won't reiterate that. I mean, mechanics in the 19th century was simple. Then we found that everything was chaotic and that uh, determinism was useless, and so we had to think about probabilities rather than trajectories. Uh, but what happened in the last uh, 50 years, maybe, is, is the physics of complex systems where one can talk about the kind of bubble butterfly effect, which is that these complex systems are such that probabilities themselves become chaotic, become sensitive to parameters, initial conditions, or even time. And so probabilities themselves in these systems are unknowable, which I think conceptually is quite interesting. And this is true even if all states of the world are unknown. And these probabilities, they change over time all the time. So you can't even guess what probabilities they are. They're, they're non ergodic And I'll explain the little picture later on. So let me explain a little bit these concepts with a highly stylized model. And, and this first model is what I call the simple complex system. And you'll see why. So it's a simple model of self-fulfilling prophecies, where agents' optimism, say, depend on other agents' optimism. So if everybody's optimistic, then everybody's optimistic, and vice versa. And you can think of this model as roughly these two wells, these two valleys. One corresponds to a globally optimistic state, which is persistent, and, and one where it's globally <coughs> optimistic. But due to random shocks to the, the economy, the, the system can flip from one state to the other. We would call that a crisis or a crash, whatever. But in these models, you can compute the probability for such a, a crash. And it turns out that it, it, it depends exponentially on the parameters. And in particular, it depends exponentially on one over the amplitude of the noise term. But that means this exponential uh, dependence, exactly like the exponential growth of error that Eric had talked about, means that any error in your model is going to be exponentially amplified. And so, even if you have a perfect model, but you don't very know very well the parameters, you know, you can go from probabilities of flipping from 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 20, just by changing a little bit the parameters. So, when the knowledge of the system is only partial, the crash probability in, in, the, in the very model is just unknowable. And so these rare events, they cannot be quantified. They can't be observed either. I mean, this is, this is a little bit the story that we heard about the, the planes on the uh, towers. If you have rare events, you can't even make statistics on these rare events. And in this model, you see that if delta here changes with time, this probability will also change with time in an unpredictable way. So there's no way that markets can have a real... Uh, a realistic view on this, on these exponentially rare probabilities. A richer time model. So imagine a model of n interacting firms that must choose between two cities. Uh, they, uh, uh, they have to you know, operate either in city A or in city B. And we're going to assume that firms are either beneficial, as will correspond to coupling positive, or detrimental to each other. And just to make the math simple, if the firm is in city A, its index S is 1, and if it's in city B, the S index is minus 1. And in this model, the total output is given by this formula, which just means that firms want to be in the city where they can cooperate maximally and, and put in the other city uh, firms with which they, uh, they have detrimental interactions. So, okay, so this is a highly stylized output function, if you want, but the interesting, uh, the interesting point about this function is that it's a, a hugely complicated problem to solve. This extremely simple equation with s equal minus 1 or plus 1 for each firm, again, si is 1 if it's in city A, minus 1 if it's in city B, it's uh, called, called the NP-hard problem. So it means that the best algorithms to solve this problem numerically need a, a time that's exponentially large in the size of the system. In other words, as soon as you have like 100 or 200 firms, you cannot solve the problem. So even a benevolent social planner cannot know the right allocation. 
So, so if you imagine that this model would be put in, in, in to work, then firms would individually try to uh, taton, taton to find their, their best city, but the system as a whole would get, will get stuck in one of the many possible one-flip state. So one-flip means that no firm can improve its, uh, the global output by changing uh, city. So in this model, rationality is de facto limited because you can't assume that you're going to know what others are doing because it's just random. They're going to choose globally a completely random quasi-optimal solution, but it's one in a million, and you, you have no way to guess that. <coughs> so this is a, a, another example of this chaoticity of probabilities, if you want. <coughs> so let's move towards progressively towards more uh, realistic models. This is a model of ecology. So now we have species in, in, instead of firms. We'll go back to firms later. And these species are pairwise, beneficial, or detrimental. So this is a very well-known model. And in this model, the population's NI are, general, are described by a generalized loss capital terra, which is also called the predator-prey dynamics. And this equation, you don't have to look at in detail. There's a J here, which is similar to my J in the previous slide, positive if uh, species are in symbiosis and negative in, if they're in competition. Anyway, this equation is the simplest model that describes fitness of the species and this either competition or symbiosis. Note that there's a constraint, of course, in these equations that all the populations must obviously be positive or zero, can't be negative. So if you look into this you know, complex but not that complicated model, you find a very interesting uh, phenomenology. You find that equilibrium for large N is such that only some species can survive. Some species have to die. But this equilibrium is actually marginally stable. So it's at the border of instability. This is a little graph here showing the, um, uh, well, the eigenvalues of the stability matrix. And, and you see that they touch zero. And underlying the, the, the landscape of this model is this extremely rough, complicated landscape where each little minima corresponds to a possible equilibrium. And again, all these um, equilibria, they're extremely sensitive to small perturbations. So if you don't know <coughs> extremely precisely these GIJs, you will be completely wrong in your prediction of which species will uh, survive. So now, um, by the way, this was uh, unsubstantiated in, in a uh, fantastic paper, one-page paper in '72 by Sir Robert May in Nature, called "Will Large Complex Systems Be Stable?" And this stability that he talks about is when you increase the, the size of the economy. So now let's go back to uh, economics or macroeconomics and look at a model for the ecology of firms in a network. So now I'm considering a model of any interacting firms instead of species with some production function that has a constant elasticity of substitution, some uh, insubstitutability in the model. And it turns out the, equation, the equilibrium equations for prices in this model of prices and productions are identical if you, you know, do the uh, corrections that you need to do <coughs> to the equilibrium conditions of the La Cavaltera that I just talked about. So we envisage this problem within the, the, the context of uh, fund networks with uh, my student, Jose Moore, uh, a few months ago, and for our paper, will large economies be stable with reference to uh, Robert May's, uh, Sir Robert paper. So in this model, you find that economies get unstable when productivities decrease, markups increase, substitutability decrease, connectivity increases, or, or actually size increases, like in May's example. And the conjecture that comes out very naturally from this model is that economies may be driven spontaneously to this marginal civility point that I talked about in the ecology concept. And actually, this idea was <coughs> first promoted in the economics literature in a paper by Back, uh, Chen, Shankman, and Woodford in '92, within a model that I think was so uh, you know, uh, irrealistic that nobody paid really attention. But that's the scenario that in physics is called self-organized practicality. That spontaneously system by their own device tend to go right at the border of stability. So if that's true, it means that economies would be intrin intrinsically fragile 
and their fate unpredictable, even statistically, because of this complexity. And what's nice about this model is, as a bonus, when, you, when these economies are close to this critical point, you get the well-known fat tail distribution of thumb sizes, and the <coughs> distribution that was, for example, uh, exhibited uh, empirically by Rob Axel. And, and the fact that when you have a crisis, it can be either a very small crisis or a landslide where all the thumbs uh, go past. So I think it's a very interesting idea of a, a model for endogenous crisis, where nothing fundamental happens, but the, the, the economy, in a way by design, is, is close to this critical point that generates small shocks like large business cycle, as Ben and Anke was talking about uh, in the 90s. Thank you very much.